Hi, I'm Andrew Chang. Welcome to About That. So Canada soccer has been in the news a whole lot lately and kind of for all the wrong reasons. Canada's national women's team so fed up it refused to play at a key tournament in Florida this week only relenting when Canada soccer threatened legal action. Then this week, Nick Bontis, who's the head of Canada soccer, released this statement. Let me read a part of it for you. While I have been one of the biggest proponents of equalizing the competitive performance environment for our women's national team, I will unfortunately not be leading this organization when it happens. I acknowledge that this moment requires change. Now, this comes after wide calls for Bontis' resignation. It's just the latest blow up in what has been a tumultuous year. And in order to dig into just how bad it got, you have to understand what Canada soccer's most successful team has been battling against these past few months and what those women have been fighting for. It's pretty disgusting that we're having to ask just to be treated equally. Um, it's a fight that women all over the world have to partake in every single day, but quite frankly, we're really sick of it. Um, and it's something that now I don't even get disappointed by anymore. I just get angry about. When most people think of Canadian women's soccer, they think of moments like this. 2012 Olympics in London. Uh, this was the Canadian women up against France. And the game winner, Diana Matheson, uh, in extra time, 92 minutes into the game to secure an Olympic bronze medal. This would be the first one ever for the team. Quite a moment. Fast forward, four years later, this was uh, in Rio 2016. I remember being in Rio for these games. Christine Sinclair would have the game winner here. Back to back bronze medal performances. And I remember people saying, I think this is it. This is the moment women's soccer in Canada explodes. But then it got even crazier. So 2020 Tokyo, gold medal game, this is against Sweden. It goes to extra time, goes to penalties, and this moment when the Canadian women knew that they were making history. But here's the problem. In a year where the women have all the momentum in the world, they have an Olympic track record, they have the creation of their very own pro soccer league and a World Cup coming up in less than six months, these are the headlines we're seeing. Canadian women's soccer players outraged and deeply concerned over funding cuts. Canadian women's national soccer team on strike over budget cuts and pay equity. Canadian women end strike, citing threat of legal action from Canada soccer. So today on About That, how did we get from all of that to all of this? The first thing to understand about everything in Canadian soccer boiling over all at once is that it's actually been simmering for years. Canada soccer has a history of not seeing eye to eye with its players. What the heck happened? Uh, all of a sudden people were getting excited for this game today and it's over. What, what, why is this happening? Last summer, in the lead-up to a friendly matchup against Panama, negotiations between the men's national team and Canada soccer hit a wall. A moment of joy back in March when Canada clinched a spot in the Men's World Cup for the first time in 36 years. But off the field, a battle over compensation was just beginning. Compensation was a big part of it. And the players were so frustrated that they refused to train in the days leading up to the Panama game and the game was canceled just hours before kickoff. Canada soccer was not happy. If we as an association only had the men's team and the women's team to take care of and nothing else, we could still not afford this proposal. It is untenable as written. And now we're seeing a similar story play out with the women. Contract talks have stalled. Their last collective agreement expired more than a year ago. And this year is a big one for them. And now Canada are less than half an hour away to another FIFA Women's World Cup birth. They're heading to the Women's World Cup in Australia and New Zealand this July. And they're good, like really good. Of 187 soccer nations, Canada is ranked number six. Maybe this will be Christine Sinclair's last World Cup. 
But to prepare, you have to play. The She Believes Cup tournament begins in Florida this week, but a few days ago, the Canadian women's national team threatened to strike. But less than a week before kickoff. As a team, we've, we've decided to take job action. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? That same day, an open letter posted on social media. With the biggest tournament in women's football history less than six months away, our preparation for the World Cup and the future success of the women's national team program are being compromised by Canada soccer's continued inability to support its national team. The women's team statement goes on. We have been told quite literally that Canada soccer cannot adequately fund the women's national team and they have waited to tell us this until now. The reality is we showed up to a camp where we're staying in accommodation that's uh, below the standard of accommodation that I personally have stayed in since I've been on the team, which has been quite some time. Um, we've seen a cut in our staff. We don't have as many staff as we have in the past had in camp. And while the Canadian women were making the case that they're effectively playing world-class soccer on the cheap, Canada Soccer was busy preparing its own statement. We need to have a collective bargaining agreement in place to responsibly plan for the future. We presented an equity-based proposal to our national teams and their council several months ago, and we are still waiting for a definitive response to the terms of that proposal. We want to get this resolved for both of our national teams and for soccer in Canada. And it turns out that resolution, at least in the short term, would be to threaten the players with legal action and potentially millions of dollars in damages. In a statement, Canada Soccer said, the players were not and are not in a legal strike position under Ontario labour law. So, after missing just one day of training, Christine Sinclair said this on social media, to be clear, we are being forced back to work for the short term. This is not over. Canada's national women's team taking to the pitch in purple, a symbol of equality. Their latest protest in an ongoing and increasingly ugly fight to be treated and paid the same as the men. So why don't the women's team and Canada soccer see eye to eye? After all, this doesn't sound like the kind of relationship you'd expect from a governing body and its reigning Olympic champions. Well, in one sense, it has everything to do with equity. The fact that Canada soccer is tightening its budget after the Men's World Cup, but before the women's. Umbrella view is that we, we want the same budget that the men's national team was provided last year into their World Cup, um, which will in turn solve the problems that we've seen come from the budget cuts. Now, we know the men's and women's teams have not historically been treated equally. In 2021, Canada Soccer spent $11 million on the men's team, but only $5.1 million on the women's team. And according to Christine Sinclair, about half that amount actually came from Own the Podium, a Canadian nonprofit, not Canada Soccer itself. But this is as much about transparency. For years, both teams have been demanding a closer look at Canada Soccer's books. For as long as we've been fighting this fight, um, the CSA tends to hold their cards close and, and not share uh, what the budgets are for, for various programs. Um, and so we're constantly fighting blind. And so we've demanded a, a complete breakdown of the men's budget from last year. And so, so we know what we're up against. And consider this statement from the men's national team, posted in solidarity shortly after the women first announced they were going on strike. Since June 2022, Canada Soccer has consistently refused or blatantly ignored our Players Association's requests for access to its financial records to back up its claims that it does not have the funds to properly operate Canada Soccer or fairly compensate the players and demands that it explain what has happened to millions of dollars that it should be receiving each year from sponsors and other sources. Now that last part about sponsors begins to hint at what might be one source of financial constraint on Canada soccer, why it's either unwilling or unable to give the players what they want. Canada soccer to me has not been transparent enough 
in where the money comes from and where the money goes. It's a public organization, I guess, federal funding. Like, I don't understand how you can sort of be secretive about this. There's this really strange contract with Canadian soccer business, it's called, which is a private entity that also runs the Canadian Premier League. Canada soccer, we know, is the governing body for soccer in Canada. Canada Soccer Business is a separate private company aligned with the Canadian Premier League, which is a men's domestic pro league. Canada Soccer and Canada Soccer Business have a multi-year deal in which Canada Soccer has given up its media and sponsorship rights in exchange for a guaranteed annual fee of between three and four million dollars per year. So what does that mean? Well, let's say Nike pays to use an image of Alfonso Davies or Christine Sinclair in an ad. Neither Canada Soccer nor the national teams see a single penny of that money. It all goes to Canada Soccer business and in turn, the men's domestic pro league. Canada Soccer says, hey, it's a guaranteed source of revenue and long-term is about growing the game in this country. Critics wonder if Canada Soccer just made a bad deal at the players' expense, especially given how strong the two national teams are and how much those sponsorship deals could be worth. And the worst part, they say, that deal could be extended all the way to 2037. Are we really growing the game um, in, the, in the appropriate way? And I can't say we are. We are a small organization. Think of what we've done. We hosted a Women's World Cup that broke records. We had our women become Olympic gold medal champions that no one will ever take away as an outgrowth of a back-to-back -back bronze and bronze performance. And quite frankly, we've been asked to do more with less for the entire time all of us have been on this national team. And if we can go win a gold medal with what we've been given, I just can't imagine what this team can do if we're given the proper resources. But my job as president is a responsibility to the fiduciary and stable health of this organization, not just for the last 120 years that we've been alive, for the next 100 years they're going to be alive. And I can't accept an offer that will put our organization in a financial position that is untenable. So now we begin to see this labor dispute is no flash in the pan. It's a product of one side seeing the other as unrealistic, too demanding, and the other side perpetually asking, where's the money? Welcome back to About That. So, yes, we are talking about this conflict, this ongoing conflict between the Canadian women's national team in soccer and Canada soccer. And, of course, the latest development here, one of the latest developments, that Nick Bontis, the president of the organization, has resigned, unable to find any kind of a resolution, a longstanding resolution to this problem. So to help us find some answers... Signa Butler joining us right now. You've got all the answers. Oh, sure. Right? Thanks for the pressure, Andrew. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Signa Butler of, of CBC Sports, and you've been following this story for a long time. First of all, what do we make of the appointment of Charmaine Crooks? So, in a way, it's sort of an obvious choice, right? Because Charmaine Crooks, the VP of uh, the Board of Directors, put into this job. What do you make of that as a, as a solution to this problem? I mean, bylaws and practices, as you said, you know, kind of move up the vice president into the president's role. But yeah. I mean, anytime you have a five-time Olympian uh, as your president, as your acting president, uh, somebody who sat on boards before, whether it's the Canadian Olympic Committee or the International Olympic Committee, I think, you know, that's a good thing. Not to mention the fact that she's the first woman to hold that position and the first person of color to hold that position. So it's a different voice at the table whether or not she's been part of the board before. And I say that... Well, yeah, because I was going to ask about this, yeah. whether people would perceive her as being part of the problem, like, like whether they would want the whole board of directors yeah. flushed out. So I think ultimately, yes. Uh, I'll just put that out there. I think, like, she's a credible person, but she's been, she's been part of this board for a number of years now. And this board, I think, overall, as the men's and the women's team have been saying, they have a problem with the leadership. Right, whether it's at the top of Canada soccer and whether it's on the board of governors. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's 
you know, I think even if she decides to run again, I think what they need, because trust has been eroding, not just for the last couple of years, but for decades, is somebody that has a fresh, fresh perspective from, from a sports angle, from a sports lens. Um, it's come to a point that, that they need to solve this and, and solve it quickly. There's five months until the Women's World Cup. Right. Five months. Do, so let me ask you this. Do we know enough about the state of the problem or, or even the state of finances for Canada soccer to know like whether this is an easily solvable problem, right? Like given the demands of the players, given the requirement to, I mean, try to try to fund all the programs adequately so that they're set up to succeed. But at the same time as Canada soccer has its hands tied in a manner of speaking with this whole Canada soccer business sponsorship yes. deal. And without knowing, and, and this is what the players have been calling for is transparency. Without knowing the exact, you know, minutia of that deal with Canada soccer business, um, they, they don't have the numbers really to go with. What we do know is that there is a lump sum that Canada Soccer Business, who controls the broadcast media sponsorship and marketing rights of the national teams, um, they give a chunk of change to Canada Soccer. It's somewhere in the th sort of three to four million dollar range. Yeah. But you have to remember the men's team has been successful, qualified for a World Cup ahead of 2026, qualifying for Qatar. The women's team, three Olympic medals, including Olympic gold in Tokyo 2020. This deal was done in 2019, maybe without foresight of the fact that these teams were on the up and up. Can they get out of the deal? Well, I think they're going to have to, if they want to get out of a deal, it's going to be a litigation situation. You know, mm. this has been a deal that was done in, well, they say it's done in stone. I think you'll have to look. I, I think that the players are consulting lawyers about this. Right. I think that they're, they'd love to open it up. I think they would have loved to have been consulted on this deal before it was made because it is their images. It is their livelihood that was affected by this whole thing. Sure, so sure. so at the time, I think it looked like a good deal. And lots of lots of countries all over the world do this kind of deal to sell their broadcast and marketing rights. It's not, not new, but did they foresee how successful the programs would be and how sponsors would come into play and how much money is actually in the pot? We don't know that until it's maybe revealed. And maybe we'll find that out at uh, the Heritage Committee at, uh, at Parliament. And, and meanwhile, while we wait, whether it's for that committee hearing or any kind of resolution to this, I, it just strikes me that none of this can possibly be any good for the game itself. It, it's not. It's not. I mean, a budget cut for both of these teams, that being said, you know, a budget cut for both of these teams is not good. Uh, five months ahead of the Women's World Cup this yeah. summer in Australia and New Zealand, not good. But I have to say, like, I, everything that I've seen, you know, the public's behind them. The public wants to know what's at the root of this problem. Can it be solved? Can they get a deal done ahead of Australia? Can they get a, you know, that's that's my question. <laughs> Can they get a deal done? It's a big, big question to answer. <laughs> uh, that's a big question. And there are a lot of other big questions. We got to leave it there, though. Uh, hey, Signa Butler, thanks for being on the program. Any, Appreciate anytime. it. Anytime. And thank you for tuning in to About That. Take care.